Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be joining us. My name is Peter Arvo, and I'll be your guide during the Torchbearer series. This is Course B501, Suppressed Bible Manuscript History, and we're obviously in Session 1. Not all Bibles are based upon the same Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text, from Manuscript Basics to Tempus Absumo to the reliability of text in the Biblical Redundant Array of Independent Documents, also known as B-RAID. The primary purpose of this three-part course is to provide you with stronger faith, trust, and love for God and His holy ways. The corresponding supplemental lecture notes and page briefing PDF documents contain some advanced features that may otherwise be missed. And as such, if you have not already viewed the short audio-video lecture called How to Navigate Within Lectures and Page Briefings, it is recommended you do so before proceeding in order to get the most out of this lecture series. But it isn't required. Also, if possible, visit the website to obtain the most recent version of this lecture and related documents. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few important quotes with you, which you might like to keep in mind as we go through this course. The first quote is, quote, The largest impediment to discovering truth is the belief you already have it, end quote. Although the origin of this quote is unknown, it's definitely profoundly true. The second quote is, These, meaning the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. The book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 11. The third quote is, He is like a man which built a house, and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Luke chapter 6 verse 48 and our last quote is if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do psalms chapter 11 verse 3 you see without a strong foundation a person's faith can be destroyed and together we are going to ensure you have a strong foundation this session is broken up into two main sections First, we will briefly go over general manuscript information, which includes the materials used in the creation of manuscripts, the time period in which they were used, the general writing tools, and the cultures that utilized them. Second, we will look at the different types of manuscripts, codex for scroll, for example, the various methods used to date the manuscripts, the copying methods used to prevent mistakes, the Tempus Apsumo, which is Latin for how long they survive before they are destroyed and need to be replaced, and lastly, the reliability of the text. I'd like to mention that besides the references presented in this audio-video lecture series, additional references are available in the supplemental lecture notes. Also, many of the charts and diagrams shown in this lecture series are available as separate files, which you can use for your own purposes in accordance with the Creative Commons Copyright License Agreement. The reference areas of the charts also contain high-resolution scans of the pages being referenced, with the pertinent information underlined in red, so that you're able to quickly and easily read the reference text in its original context. There are many questions that will be answered by the end of this session, including What is a manuscript? What are the manuscript tools and copying methods? How long did manuscripts survive before a replacement was needed? Did people write down what Jesus said as he spoke? Were backup copies created? What is B-RAID and why is it so important? What is an unbroken manuscript chain of custody and does it matter? Did God say he would preserve most or all of his words? Does the Bible tell us if translations are divinely inspired? Plus many more. To quickly summarize this area, it basically says to assume all dates are approximate even if it is not indicated as being approximate in the text. At times, dashes are used for adjoining Bible verses as opposed to using commas. So starting with papyrus and then parchment, we're going to go over the material composition, the time periods that they were in active use, the writing tools, and the cultures that utilized them. 
Some of this might not be new to you, but it's important to ensure that there are no gaps in knowledge before we get to the really interesting sections. So let's begin. First up in our list is papyri manuscripts. Papyri manuscripts are made from papyrus plants which grow in flooded swamps throughout African and Mediterranean countries. It should be mentioned that papyrus is singular while papyri is plural. Historian Margaret Bunsen describes the process whereby the plants were made in the workable sheets. Quote, the stem of the papyrus plant was cut into thin strips which were laid side by side in perpendicular fashion. A solution of resin from the plant was laid down and a second layer of papyrus was put into place horizontally. The two layers were then pressed and allowed to dry. Immense rolls of papyrus could be made by joining the single sheets. The sides of the papyrus where the fibers run horizontally are the recto and where the fibers run vertically the verso. The recto was preferred but the verso was used for documents as well, allowing two separate texts to be included on a single papyrus. Just as a fun fact, the English word paper comes from the Latin word papyrus which comes from the Greek word papyros. Each culture may have had a slightly different process, but the concept would remain the same, which is you are essentially weaving and pressing plant fibers together with either a plant-based resin or an animal-based glue, which then creates a strong and durable writing surface. If you feel so inclined, you can head on over to wikihow.com forward slash make dash papyrus and you can learn how to make your own papyrus paper. In 2013, Professor of Egyptology Pierre Talit discovered the oldest known papyrus at Wadi El Jarf, which is an ancient Egyptian harbor located on the coast of the Red Sea. These documents dated from approximately 2560 to 2550 BC, which is at the end of the reign of Pharaoh Khufu, and were written by men who participated in the building of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Manuscript P46 is an example of biblical papyri that contains most of the Pauline epistle, 2 Corinthians 11.33 through 12.9. It has been paleographically dated between 175 AD and 225 AD by Bruce Griffin. Papyrus was actively used as late as 1022 AD in the form of papal decrees from the Roman Church, and are still used to create tourist souvenirs in Egypt. The most common type of pigment seen on papyri is carbon black ink. The process of making the ink is quite simple per Rachel Danzing, a conservator of paper at the Brooklyn Museum. Quote, the ink is made by burning organic materials such as wood or oil and then pulverizing the material before mixing it with water. To keep the particles from clumping together, the black is mixed with a binder, probably a plant gum. As well as keeping the carbon particles suspended in the water solution, the gum binder helps to keep the ink adhered to the papyrus surface. This ink is very stable, does not fade, and does not deteriorate the papyrus below as some metallic inks can do. The ink was held in a wooden or sometimes ivory palette, which had a depression in it. Today we would call it an inkwell. The Hebrew word wekwazet, mentioned in Ezekiel 9.2, Ezekiel 9.3, and Ezekiel 9.11 as inkhorn, was the term for a case in which ingredients for making ink were kept. A scribe customarily carried his inkhorn in his belt, which can be referred to as a girdle in biblical times. The most common type of scribal pen used during biblical times was the reed pen, used roughly between 800 BC and 400 AD. Since there is evidence papyri dates back before 800 BC, it stands to reason that the tools and methods to write on the papyrus would go back prior to 800 BC. Papyrus was used by many cultures and was exported throughout the classical world. According to the University of Michigan papyrology team, quote, it was the most popular writing material for the ancient Greeks and Romans. Papyrus was also the medium of the New Testament in the early centuries after the death of Jesus. However, as we will see later, this would not have always been the case. Shown on the left is a 3rd century AD Greek papyrus of the Gospel of Luke. Knowing that the Roman Empire used papyrus, we can see by looking at a map of ancient Rome just how far its use would have been. The borders of the Roman Empire would have reached as far west as Portugal, 
as far east as Iran, as far north as northern England, and as far south as Egypt. As a side note, Rome emerged as a Roman Republic around 500 BC and then became a Roman Empire in 30 BC, which fell in the year of 476 AD. This empire never fully collapsed, it merely broke apart. We will now discuss parchment. Parchment is a strong and stable material, which is why the five pages of the U.S. Constitution, as well as the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Articles of Confederation were written on parchment. We know from the Bible that at least some of the time the New Testament autographs could have been written on parchment. When we refer to autographs, we mean the original source documents, which were either written in the author's own hand or written by a professional scribe writing under the supervision of the author. In either case, it's the original document that we are referring to. From 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, we read, quote, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Parchment can be made from different animal skins, including goats, sheep, bulls, and cows. The best quality came from young cows or bulls called calves. This parchment is called vellum, which comes from the French word vu. The skin is soaked in a lime mineral water solution, then scraped, cleaned, and dried. The British Broadcasting Corporation, also known as the BBC, made a short four-minute video of this process that can be viewed online for free. See the below two references if you're interested. Parchment was used from at least as far back as the time of Moses. According to Rabbinical Judaism, this would have been approximately 1312 BC, and arguably much earlier. Parchment is still manufactured in Israel today and used by Jewish rabbis. A feather or reed was, and still is, traditionally used as a quill to write on parchment. It should be mentioned that new parchment is snow white in color and yellows with time. This can be seen in the U.S. Bill of Rights parchment, for an example, which appears slightly yellowed or tanned, as shown a few images earlier. You may want to make a mental note of how new white parchment appears, since this is an important observation that will show up in a future session on the topic of manuscript forgeries. The name parchment apparently derives from the ancient Greek city of Pergamum, which is the modern-day city of Bergamo, Turkey, where parchment is said to have been invented in the 2nd century BC. But essentially any culture that had access to animals would have been able to create a form of parchment, and knowing this it would be impossible to know how many earlier cultures utilized it. There are thousands of important ancient artifacts that preserve the eyewitness testimonies of historic events, people, geographic locations, and writings. Although the pictured example is not made of metal, clay, or stone, it is worth mentioning. The charred lumps of what appeared to be animal skin scroll fragments known as the En Gedi scroll contains a portion of the Old Testament, Book of Leviticus, which is identical to the modern Masoretic Old Testament text. For the sake of time, we will only focus on a small portion of the information that is contained in some of these artifacts and within the biblical text itself. This will serve the purpose to demonstrate that multiple redundant ancient sources can collaborate the biblical narrative. There are at least four ancient Iron Age stelas that mention Israel by name besides containing other biblical information. The first is the Israel Stella, dated to around 1208 BC. It was discovered in Thebes, Egypt. This stella is a black granite slab measuring over 10 feet high. It currently resides in the Cairo Egyptian Museum. The inscription written upon it says it was carved in the 5th year of Merneta of the 19th dynasty. The second is the Kirk monoliths, dating to around 852 BC and 879 BC. These limestone Assyrian stellas were discovered in the country of Turkey and currently reside in the British Museum. Besides mentioning Israel, the Akkadian cuneiform written on the stella also references Ahab, one of the kings of Israel committing 2,000 chariots and 10,000 foot soldiers to the Assyrian war coalition. 
The third is the Tel Dan Stella, dated to around 870 BC to 750 BC. Made of basalt, this old Aramaic text inscribed stella was discovered in northern Israel and currently resides in the Israel Museum. It has what is considered the earliest widely accepted reference to the name David as the founder of the kingdom of Judah outside of the Hebrew Bible. The fourth is the Mesha stella dated to around 840 BC. This is another basalt stone stella which was discovered in the country of Jordan. Written in the ancient Moabite language, which is related to the Phoenician alphabet in the Hebrew script, the stella's stories parallel, with some differences, an episode in the Bible's Book of the Kings, specifically 2 Kings chapter 3 verses 4 through 8. All of these four Iron Age stellas provide a written account of diverse eyewitness testimonies, including four countries, Egypt, Turkey, Israel, and Jordan, and four cultures with distinct languages, Egyptian hieroglyphs, Old Akkadian, Old Aramaic, and Ancient Moabite, which confirm the early existence of Israel during the time the Bible says Israel existed. There are some 2,000 impressions made by at least 21 seal types that have been published, called LMLK seals, which are ancient Hebrew seals stamped on the handles of large storage jars, dating from the reign of King Hezekiah around 700 BC, discovered mostly in and around Jerusalem. There is a Nabonidus cylinder from Sippar and three Nabonidus cylinders from Ur for a total of four cylinders. What makes these four cylinders noteworthy is that they contain strong overlapping biblical information. For example, they mention the Godhead, which can be interpreted as an Old Testament allusion to Yahweh and or the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Godhead is also mentioned three times in the Bible, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 29, in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, and in Colossians, chapter 2, verse 9. The Nabonidus cylinders mention a son, Belshazzar, which could be the same Belshazzar mentioned in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. The cylinders state, quote, As for me, Nabonidus, king of Babylon, save me from sinning against your great godhead, and grant me, as a present, a life of long days. And as for Belshazzar, the eldest son, my offspring, instill reverence in your great godhead in his heart, and may he not commit any cultic mistake. May he be sated with a life of plenitude. The Ketef Hinnom amulets, also known as the Ketef Hinnom silver scrolls, are two scrolls, KH1 and KH2, inscribed with what might be the oldest surviving text from the Old Testament. The Hebrew text is from the Book of Numbers and is written in the old Paleo-Hebrew characters. The scrolls are dated to around 650 BC to 587 BC. The scrolls are also significant because they, quote, preserve the earliest known citations of texts also found in the Hebrew Bible and the earliest examples of confessional statements concerning Yahweh, end quote. The reference to Yahweh as, quote, rebuker of evil. Now we move on to our second and last section covering manuscript information. There are two primary types of manuscripts, the scroll and the codex. But first we should go over what is a manuscript. When we refer to a manuscript, we're referring to any handwritten text on papyrus, parchment, or paper before the invention of printing. A manuscript can be abbreviated in written form as MS for a single manuscript and MSS for multiple manuscripts. A scroll is a roll of papyrus, parchment, or paper containing writing. Parchment scrolls were used by the Israelites, among others, before the invention of the Codex. As a side note, if you ever run into someone that can't remember the difference between a scroll and a codex, tell them to remember that scroll rhymes with roll, pictured as a scroll of the Old Testament book of Isaiah. A codex is a bound book constructed of several sheets of papyrus, parchment, paper, or similar materials. 
The term codex is now typically only used to describe books with handwritten content. The codex was invented by the Romans, which became popular around the first century AD. Some of the advantages of the codex over the scroll are the improved compact size, sturdiness, the economic aspects of the materials by using both sides, recto and verso, and having ease of reference, being able to jump to any section quickly. There are two main categories of dating techniques, relative and absolute. Relative dating is the method of sequencing events in the order in which they happened. Relative dating places events in order without any measure of the age between events. On the other hand, absolute dating, which is sometimes preferably called calendar dating since absolute implies an unwarranted certainty of accuracy, is the process of determining an age on a specified chronology in archaeology and geology. Absolute dating is usually based on the physical, chemical, and life properties of the material from artifacts such as manuscripts, buildings, and other items that have been modified by humans. There are some techniques that can nearly fall within both dating categories. On the topic of dating ancient artifacts, it is worth pointing out that there has never been an archaeological discovery which has conclusively disproven anything in the Bible. In fact, we have just the opposite occurring, such as in the case with Jericho. According to Bryant Wood, Ph.D., quote, Every aspect of the story that could possibly be verified by the findings of archaeology is, in fact, verified. End quote. For the biblical account of the incident at Jericho, see the book of Joshua. Given that entire books have been written detailing the pros and cons of just one dating method, and since we will focus on more pressing matters, we will only briefly cover the dating methods most important to manuscripts. As this course progresses, you will see why dating methods are not as critical as you may have first thought, as long as there are overwhelming diverse eyewitness testimonies. If, however, there is a lack of good witnesses, then testing for a forgery becomes critically important. The first dating method is the decay rate of radioactive isotopes. The calculation of radioactive decay is based on three crucial assumptions. The initial conditions are known, the system has been closed, and the radioactive decay rate has remained constant. The radioactive decay rate of the parent isotopes of uranium, thorium, potassium, rubidium, and carbon-14 into the daughter isotopes of lead, argon, strontium, and nitrogen-14 runs into this problem, as do any other radioactive isotopes. Additional references are available in the supplemental lecture notes. Compounding the problem is the variable radioactive decay rate caused by changes in solar activity, and physicists have also now measured a slowing in the speed of light over time as published in the journal Nature and dubbed C-Decay. This contradicts the uniformitarian view held by many. Since most nuclear processes are mathematically related to the speed of light, a faster c, as in E equals mc squared, might well mean a faster rate of radioactive decay. Again, like usual, if you're interested, there are normally additional references contained within the supplemental lecture notes for each session of this presentation, even if it is not expressly mentioned within the lecture. I'd like to briefly mention that there are many processes observed in nature that destroy the uniformitarian view, also known as the doctrine of uniformity. The uniformitarian view is, in essence, a form of normalcy bias, meaning that if things have been perceived to be a certain way over a certain period of time, an assumption is then formed that it must have always been that way and continues to be that way. The uniformitarian view and the normalcy bias are the prevailing views in science and politics throughout the world. The total opposite stance, catastrophism, is not much better, which is rapid, unexpected changes. The reality appears to be something in between. The point is that when many dating methods are based upon a uniformitarian view, most dating methods are based upon flawed assumptions. A quick rundown of the carbon-14 testing assumptions are 
Number one, the solar activity and sea decay have been unchanged. Number two, known and stable environmental conditions. Number three, known stable absorption rate. Number four, no unknown changes in radioactive material in the environment. Number five, the materials being tested are between 2,000 and 100,000 years old. Number six, the results are within the scientific status quo. Much more information is available in the supplemental lecture notes on this subject matter, including carbon-14 test results that have been suppressed by the AGU and the AOGS. We now move on to a better candidate for testing documents, and what we were more interested in anyway, which is our second dating method, chemical ink analysis. In the opinion of many at the time of this lecture, the best non-destructive chemical ink analysis method to use is called microroman spectroscopy. Roman can be used to study chemical bonding, provide a fingerprint to identify molecules, and be paired up with other non-destructive testing methods, like infrared spectroscopy. Roman spectroscopy is a great non-destructive way to investigate artwork and ancient manuscripts, allowing for the identification of forgeries. It allows for the identification of individual pigments within the manuscript, and their degradation products provide insight into the working method of the artist. An example of a manuscript forgery that was discovered by using the non-destructive micro-Raman spectroscopy was the Gospel of Jesus' wife. In quoting the results, quote, surely indicate a modern forgery, end quote. As a side note, there's an international ink library maintained jointly by the United States Secret Service and the Internal Revenue Service which includes more than 9,500 inks dating from the 1920s. This ink library is only useful in the detection of forgeries produced since the 1920s. So for older items like ancient art, archaeology, and manuscripts, we would use something like the Raman Spectroscopic Library of Natural and Synthetic Pigments or the free Raman Database of Pigments Checker. Roman also provides important information about the original state of the manuscript in instances where the pigments degraded with age. Knowing the chemical composition of the manuscript can also provide insight about the social and economic conditions when they were created, and also offer a non-invasive way to determine the best method of preservation or conservation of the manuscript. It can be difficult to date an ink unless it is known for certain that the ink did not exist when the document was said to have been prepared. There are other tests that can be conducted to glean additional information, such as polarized light microscopy, energy dispersive x-ray spectrometry, scanning electron microscope, micro x-ray diffraction, and infrared spectroscopy analysis. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but instead the intent is to simply provide a greater awareness that additional testing methods exist. The third and last dating method is paleography. Paleography uses a trained eye to date a manuscript, which entails analyzing handwriting including the quality of the line, affected by pen pressure, position, rhythm, speed, tremor, skill, and other factors. Form is analyzed, including proportions, slant beginning and ending strokes, flourishes and the like, and spelling, punctuation, abbreviation, a consequence of education, and understanding the writing materials for the specified time period. In short, it is the ability to recognize the many styles of handwriting prevalent in different ages and places. Because paleography is subjective, Paleography is the last resort for dating, and when it works well, it still typically has a margin of error of 25 to over 125 years. We should briefly discuss the importance of investigation into biblical matters. Cross-examining eyewitness testimonies to past events is just as crucial as scrutinizing physical evidence. When you can obtain diverse eyewitness testimonies to past events, which also corresponds to physical evidence, 
there is a strong reason to believe the information. Like any good investigation, it is important to know, if possible, the truthfulness and motives of the witnesses, as well as those doing the investigation. A good example of this is the work done in three books, also movies, which are available at libraries and online bookstores. The first is Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels, written by Los Angeles County homicide detective and former atheist J. Warner Wallace. The second example is called The Case for Christ, written by a Chicago Tribune investigative journalist and former atheist Lee Strobel. The third and last example is a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Life-Changing Truth for a Skeptical World, written by Josh McDowell and Sean McDowell, Ph.D. Before we go into copying methods, it should be mentioned that there is a small amount of the Jewish Old Testament written in Aramaic versus it being written in Hebrew. The Aramaic sections are, the first is Jeremiah 10.11. A single sentence denouncing idolatry occurs in the middle of the Hebrew text and was likely written in Aramaic to provide the Jews with what to say to idolaters in the idolater's own language. The second is Daniel 2, 4 through 7, 28, five stories about Daniel and his colleagues in an apocalyptic vision written in Aramaic likely because it implies King Nebuchadnezzar posted his story for his entire empire to read in their common spoken language at the time. The third is Ezra 4, 8 through 6, 18 and 7, 12 through 26, quotations of the documents from the 5th century BC on the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem, which was in Aramaic likely because it was used as communications with non-Jews. There also are Aramaic words sprinkled throughout both the Old and New Testaments. Since the Aramaic sections are so small, and Aramaic being very similar to the Hebrew language, it will not be covered separately, and is thus implicated in using the same copying methods as applied to the Hebrew Old Testament. Orthography refers to the proper spelling of each word. This is considered so important to the Torah scribe that he's instructed to, quote, be careful with your task, for it is sacred work. If you add or subtract even a single letter, it is as if you have destroyed the entire world. Each letter in the Hebrew language represents a number, as shown in the Hebrew letter number chart, and was used for many purposes, one of which was to add up the total numerical values of words, rows, and sections within the Torah in order to ensure an exact copy was made. Remember that Hebrew is written from right to left. Instructions on how the Old Testament was to be copied, specifically the first five books of the Old Testament known as the Torah, is laid down in the Hebraic law. Since over 4,000 laws must be known by the Hebrew scribe, also called a sofer, before he begins writing, we will only cover a few here. The Torah must be written by a specially trained scribe, known as a sofer or a Masorite, who are tested and certified for writing the Torah, which includes having the proper intention when writing the Torah and the name of God. There are 304,805 letters in the Torah, and if only one letter is added, missing, or changed, the Torah is not kosher, in other words, not sanctioned by Jewish law. One letter from 304,805 is a percentage of only 0.000328%. No letter may touch another one. Even within the letter itself, it may not touch itself only where it should. The Torah must be handwritten on kosher parchment, in other words, kosher animal skin. The quill used for writing must be from a kosher bird which is usually a goose or a turkey. The ink must be black, not dark blue or any other color, and are made of a special recipe of kosher ingredients. Each word and letter must be verbalized aloud while they are writing. There must be a review within 30 days, and if as many as only three pages required corrections, the entire manuscript had to be redone. 
the letters, words, and sections had to have their numerical values separately totaled up, with the different totals matching the original Torah scroll being copied from. See the previous section on Hebrew letter values. The finished Torah scroll could only be stored in sacred places, for example synagogues. Since no damaged document containing God's word could be destroyed, they were stored or buried in a genazah, meaning a repository in a synagogue. Usually in a synagogue or sometimes in a Jewish cemetery is where they were kept. These stringent laws were first followed by the Hebrew scribes called the Sopharim, then later by the Masoretes who copied the Old Testament between the 6th and the 10th centuries. The Hebrews were the torchbearers of the Old Testament, just as the followers of Jesus became the torchbearers of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. A torchbearer is a person or leader that carries and preserves a torch, who imparts knowledge, information, and truth to others. Psalm 119 in the Bible does a good job describing the dedication written within the heart of a Torah torchbearer. As a side note, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm and the longest chapter in the Bible at 176 verses. As the New Testament religious texts were written and copied, and internal evidence suggests that they knew they were continuing scripture, they would have followed Jewish copying rules, albeit in a more practical manner, and were copied by those who strongly believed in what the biblical text said for two reasons. First, most of the thousands of early followers of Christ were Jews, who would have very likely adapted their Jewish copying rules and methods to copy the new sacred text onto clean kosher animal skin parchment, not onto papyrus, at least during the early years. From Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 13 we read, quote, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments." End quote. And secondly, the followers of Christ were heavily persecuted for a period, from the time of Christ's death until 313 AD, and even if the believers had wanted to hire an unbeliever to copy the biblical text, what would be the likelihood that a well-paid professional scribe would risk copying texts that could easily get them tortured and executed? This would have probably been about as likely as a Jewish rabbi during World War II asking a German printing press employee to copy the Old Testament Hebrew religious text and the German printing press employee agreeing to it. As a side note, Jewish followers of Jesus today call themselves Messianic Jews versus calling themselves Christians. Messianic Jews existed ever since Jesus had his first followers and have suffered under persecution alongside their Gentile Christian counterparts ever since the beginning. The chart shows that there has been a massive increase of Jewish interest in Jesus, as many Jews are recognizing and embracing Jesus as the fulfillment of their Messiah and Lord. See Isaiah 53. The website and YouTube channel called One for Israel is run by Messianic Jews who are helping their fellow Jews realize who Jesus was and is, which fulfills one of the many biblical end-time prophecies. From the time of Christ's death on the cross, the followers of Christ, known as the followers of the way, were hunted down and were arrested or killed by the tens of thousands in an attempt to eradicate Christianity. Saul of Tarsus, also known by his Roman name Paul, was a Jewish Pharisee at the time with Roman citizenship, and hated the followers of the way. He made it his goal to capture them and bring them to public trial and execution. Saul was present when the first martyr, named Stephen, was killed by an angry mob in 34 AD. Saul, or Paul, later went from persecutor to follower of the way after having a profound encounter with the risen from the dead Jesus in 35 AD. See the book of Acts, chapter 9, 22, and 26. Followers of the way were first called Christians in Antioch, Syria, in 44 AD. See the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26. As a side note, Saul was his Hebrew name and Paul was his Roman name. It was common for Jews to have two first names. One name was given to them, which was associated with the local governing culture, and the other is their normal Hebrew name. 
This is also a common practice by many Jews today. These are a few Bible verses about Saul's involvement. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him, Stephen, with one accord, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hauling men and women committed them to prison. On July 18, 64 AD, a fire broke out and burned down four of the fourteen large districts in the merchant area of the city of Rome. Rumors quickly spread that the Roman Emperor Nero ordered the area to be lit ablaze himself to clear a location where he could build a new city that would bear his name. As the crowds grew in anger, Nero blamed the followers of Jesus and the people turned on them. Large-scale arrests and torturous executions followed for the Christians. The following quote is from Roman historian and senator Tacitus. Neither human aid, nor imperial bounty, nor atoning offerings to the gods could remove the sinister suspicion that the fire had been brought about by Nero's order. To put an end, therefore, to this rumor, he shifted the charge onto others, and inflicted the most cruel tortures upon a body of men detested for their abominations, and popularly known by the name of Christians. This name came from one Christus, who was put to death in the reign of origin of Tiberius by the procurator Pontius Pilate. The early Christians in Rome met in secret, where they faced horrific torture and death, with their manuscripts being destroyed. In 313 AD, Roman Emperor Constantine enacted the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity legal, and for the first time Christians were allowed to worship openly. As a side note, in 311 AD, the Roman Emperor Galerius, on his deathbed, issued the Edict of Sertica, also called the Edict of Toleration by Galerius, that Christians were treated with toleration. The return of confiscated property and the restoration of rights were not, however, part of Galerius's decree. Prior to this edict, it was the policy of the Roman Empire to torture and kill Christians openly. For at least the first three centuries, the biblical text, known as Scripture, was copied by extremely dedicated believers who were willing to risk torture and death, and would have known those scriptural warnings that God made concerning keeping his words unchanged. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it reads, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In Deuteronomy 4.2, we read, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Revelation 22, 18-19 reads, For I testify unto you every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him, the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Matthew 5.18 says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. It's worth mentioning that a jot and a tittle would be like us saying the crossing of the T or the dotting of an I. There are many other verses like these, but we'll move on. Tempus epsumo is Latin for time before destruction or annihilation. Tempus equals time, season, moment, or period. Epsumo equals destroy, annihilate, ruin, consume, use, or waste. 
The following is an excerpt from the research published in the field of Papyrus Tempus Absumo in 2014, in which literary works, correspondence, notes, and commentaries were dated, which have often made it possible in many cases to determine when manuscripts were copied and how long they were in use before being replaced, discarded, or destroyed. This quote is from Professor George W. Houston, Ph.D., in his book called Inside Roman Libraries, Book Collections and Their Management in Antiquity. Professor Houston has taught at numerous colleges and universities, as well as publishing many peer-reviewed papers. Quote, How long did a papyrus roll last? The evidence from our collections indicates that a usable lifetime of about 100 to 125 years was common and can reasonably be considered the norm. A small but significant number of manuscripts were still usable some 300 years after they were first created, and on rare occasions a manuscript might last, it seems, for half a millennium. New Testament autographs, also known as originals, would have likely used parchment, not papyrus. Since most of the New Testament writers were Jewish, they would have been aware of the rule of only writing sacred text on clean animal skin, which is parchment. Parchment is stronger, more stable, and lasts longer than papyrus, so we can expect to get at least the same or better Tempus Epsimo results with parchment as compared to papyrus. It is noteworthy to mention that according to Worcester Cathedral Library, quote, vellum has proven to last over a thousand years in excellent condition. However, it can be very vulnerable to changes in humidity, which causes pages to buckle. Books with parchment pages were bound with strong wooden boards and were clamped shut by metal clasps or leather straps in order to keep the pages pressed flat, end quote. Parchment was considered so durable that it was used for the most important legal documents in the United Kingdom at least until October 12, 2015, when the Commons Committee voted in favor of scrapping vellum, also known as parchment, as the material on which Acts of Parliament were printed, and instead adopted the use of a modern, high-quality, acid-free, long-lasting paper. So why is this new Tempus Epsumo information important? Because it was previously thought by some scholars that papyrus manuscripts would only last around 20 years, which would have required far more hand copying to occur until the first printing press Bible could be produced in 1455, the Gutenberg Bible. If we take the earliest time that a document could have been written of Christ's ministry in 27 AD, and subtract that from 1455, we have at most 1,428 years of hand copying. This means if we go from the time of Christ's ministry to the time of 1455, we would have an estimated three generations of copies for the best case scenario for papyrus, shown in green on the chart, and in the worst case scenario, 14 generations of copies for papyrus shown in yellow on the chart. In the first and best case scenario, the fourth generation is actually ending with the printing of the Gutenberg Bible, which is why it's only considered three generations. Also, this does not take into account any divine intervention for the preservation of the text. Knowing that parchment lasts longer than papyrus, and knowing that we have many manuscripts today dating between 200 A.D. and 600 A.D., and evidence contained in the Bible of the likely use of parchment, at least for a time, there is a very high probability that we only have a few generations to the printing of the very first Bible, even if only papyrus was used. For example, we have autographs, the originals that are 100% accurate, then we have the first generation copy, the second generation copy, the third generation copy, then the printed Gutenberg Bible. This is without even going into the preservation system called B-Raid, which we will discuss shortly. And also, as before, this does not take into account any divine influence in the preservation process. 
Just a reminder that all the charts in this lecture series are also contained within the supplemental lecture notes and can also be downloaded as a separate document from www.thetorchbearerseries.com. Did some disciples take notes during Jesus' ministry? The short answer is yes. Some of the disciples of Jesus would have either written in shorthand or longhand notes while he was speaking. Longhand is the normal handwriting process of fully writing out each word. Shorthand, or called stenography, is a method of abbreviating words in order to write fast enough to capture every word while someone is speaking. This is what court reporters do during trials, which is then later converted back in the longhand. The average shorthand writing speed varies depending on the profession, but they were required to write fast enough to keep up and still be accurate. For example, according to the Modern National Court Reporters Association, the NCRA, the requirement in 1949 was to maintain a shorthand writing rate of 260 words per minute to qualify to record legal testimonies. Many individuals have achieved results as high as 280 words per minute under monitored testing conditions. The world record was 350 words per minute with only two errors at that speed, so the average stenographer would have no problem keeping up with the average public speaking rate of 120 to 200 words per minute and have an accurate account of what was said. A qualification among business professionals in the Greco-Roman world was that of the tachygraphos in Greek, or in Roman Latin, notaricum, meaning shorthand writer. In the Old Testament book of Psalms, chapter 45, verse 1, it refers to a ready writer, which was a shorthand writer. Using this information, we can know that shorthand writing dates back into the Old Testament times. Scholars also agree that shorthand writing dates back even into the times of Moses and to the earliest times of writing. The following is a list of 13 scholars whose extensive research has contributed to our modern understanding of ancient shorthand writing used during biblical times. Please see the supplemental lecture notes for links to each of the scholars' publications on this topic. The image depicted is that of the Acropolis Stone, which was written in shorthand around 350 BC by a disciple of Socrates. Continuing, if you remember the Bible verse earlier when Paul spoke with Timothy, the statement was made after Saul, or Paul, became a follower of Jesus. It's important to note that it occurred after the meeting in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Council, which was when Paul, Barnabas, Paul's travel companion, James, the Lord's half-brother, the apostle Peter, and others all met together. The Jerusalem Council would have provided Paul with a great opportunity to exchange information and copy additional eyewitness testimonies, whether they were originally in text or in oral form. This means it's reasonable that the books and parchments spoken of in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 were copies of the Old Testament scripture and scripture from Jesus' ministry, besides possible blank notebooks. According to British New Testament scholar Professor Richard Bockham, notebooks were in quite widespread use in the ancient world and are based, quote, quite closely, end quote, on the testimony of eyewitnesses. The same papyrus notebook used for stenography, or shorthand, could have been used to transcribe the stenography into longhand copies, which may have occurred with the parchment of Matthew referred to as the Jesus Papyrus, also known as Magdalene College Papyrus P64 and P67, dated by Professor Karsten Peter Thide to earlier than 60 AD. By using a precise confocal laser scanning microscope, Professor Thide found that the Matthew fragment P64 revealed it read every one of them, meaning all at once, as the King James Bible reads, as opposed to each one, meaning one after another, as the critical text read from the Nestle Allen UBS textbooks used in most Bible translations after 1881. 
This appears to further confirm that most Bible translations after 1881 are not as accurate as the King James Bible for this verse in the Gospel of Matthew. More will be discussed on this later. Lord Jesus Christ spent 40 days speaking to over 500 of his followers after his resurrection, including die-hard skeptics who then became believers. Since the Bible says that some clarifications were made to their understanding after his resurrection, how easy would it be to believe that they committed those things in writing, in neither shorthand or longhand, as soon as they were able to? Wouldn't those writings provide a completely accurate account of events? There are a few that have tried to speculate that the writings of the apostles occurred after 100 AD, instead of while events unfolded. Keep in mind that the most important event after Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, around 33 AD, would have been the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And yet not a single writer of the New Testament mentions this incredibly important event, thus making a strong argument that none of the autographs, also known as the originals, were written after 70 AD, with perhaps the exception of the book of Revelation but instead were written during the time the events took place using stenography, also known again as shorthand. Remember that some events recorded in the New Testament do not pertain to Christ's ministry before the ascension, but instead were written accounts of events from the disciples as they occurred while traveling, which in some cases continued for decades until their death with John, who wrote Revelation, likely dying last. In summary, we have ample evidence from the Romans, Greeks, and Hebrews to reasonably conclude that the transmission of Lord Jesus Christ's ministry would have most likely been both oral and written, with notes being written in shorthand as Jesus spoke and later clarified by Jesus himself after his resurrection. There are also some cases that the disciples of Jesus had professional scribal assistants, in Greek called amanuensis, write their accounts under their close supervision as Paul did on numerous occasions. To get into the section we're going to briefly discuss seven items from Getting Romans to the Right Romans, Phoebe and the Delivery of Paul's Letter by Alan Chapel. The seven items summarize how Romans reached the right people for whom it was intended, for which there is widespread agreement that Phoebe was the bearer of the Roman's letter. 1. Phoebe conveyed the letter to Rome, probably by sea. 2. The church in Rome at this time consisted of house churches. 3. Phoebe was to deliver the letter first to Priscilla and Aquila and their house church. 4. Priscilla and Aquila were to convene an assembly of the whole Christian community, the first for some time, at which Romans was to be received and read. 5. Priscilla and Aquila were to be asked to arrange for copies of Romans to be made. 6. Phoebe was to deliver these copies to other house churches and 7. Phoebe was to read Romans in the way that Paul had coached her at each of the gatherings to which she took it. It is common sense that if you work during a whole winter on an important document, as Paul is presumed to have done, and know that the document may not reach its destination because of environmental conditions or hostile people, it would be prudent to have at least two autographs, two originals, of it. One to send, or called a sent autograph, and one to retain for yourself, or called a retained autograph. This process has also occurred with past authors and poets such as Emily Dickinson, and continues in modern times with email, and that you have a sent folder in your email account which retains a copy of sent emails for your records. A further reason to do this is if you suspect someone could potentially send a forged document in your name. Even after the death of the person who sent the autograph, others could verify their copy against the sent autograph or the retained autograph for authenticity. Working by day is a legitimate paleographer dating manuscripts for a university, like the pictured newspaper article proclaiming a first-century Gospel of Matthew, 
and working by night as one of the most infamous skilled forgers that ever lived, Dr. Simonides continues to have an important role today. We will cover Dr. Constantine Simonides and what appears to be his partially successful attempt to corrupt some of the Bibles in part two of this lecture series. The more first-generation copies of the autographs you have, the lower the likelihood that an error can creep in, which would make it near impossible to be corrupted. We know that there would likely be dozens of first-generation copies, which would have been created from the original autographs. This is based upon the rapid expansion of home-based Christian churches at the time, causing the need for many first-generation copies. There were an estimated 500,000 Christians by the end of the first century, out of an estimated 45 million within the entire empire of Rome. Another bit of information about the skill of Dr. Simonides comes from the Belfast newspaper article which stated that several other gentlemen of eminent paleological attainment who, on a close inspection, expressed themselves satisfied of the first century Matthew's Gospel manuscript, though it was a forgery. We are told that Paul specifically instructed Colossae and Laodicea to exchange epistles. Quote, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. End quote. Colossians chapter 4 verse 16. The following also warns of fake manuscripts, quote, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, End quote. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 2. This newspaper article from the Manchester Weekly Times and Examiner states that the Matthews Gospel manuscripts were such a clever hoax by Dr. Constantine Simonides that it took at least a couple of years before their final condemnation as a fake was proclaimed. We know from these examples and from many others in the Bible that the early Christians were exchanging and authenticating manuscripts and were on the lookout for false teachers. The newspaper called The Severance News, shown on top, not only said that it took a chemical test to prove one of Dr. Constantine Simonides' fake documents to be a fraud, but stated elsewhere in the large article that he was so knowledgeable in ancient manuscripts that he was appointed to oversee an official committee to examine antiquities by authorities. In an interesting twist, numerous newspapers, including the bottom one pictured from the Bradford Observer, stated that an alleged discovery by Dr. Constantine Tischendorf, known today as Codex Sinaiticus, was publicly refuted as a forgery by Simonides, proclaiming that he had created it himself. You would think that with such a well-known infamous forger proclaiming he created Codex Sinaiticus, and having also been previously acquainted with Dr. Constantine Tischendorf, who was the discoverer of the Codex, that Codex Sinaiticus would have been immediately chemical tested, but to this day it has not been. We will discuss this in greater detail in Session 2 and its impact on specific Bibles. It is possible that the first generation copies could have still been made from the autographs as late as the 6th century. This means that at least a few of the fragments that still exist today are likely first, second, and third generation copies, given that we also know the copies could last much longer than a few hundred years. We now get into the section on B-Raid. B-RAID stands for Biblical Redundant Array of Independent Documents, and it is one of several systems that have preserved the written text of God's Word. Since it is widely believed that Matthew was one of the disciples who was formally trained in shorthand and recorded events in shorthand, we'll use copies of his manuscripts for our B-RAID example. More specifically, the Koine Greek text, also known as Common Greek or Biblical Greek, from Matthew, chapter 26, verses 29 through 35. First, before getting into that, let's briefly see how this process became known as B-Raid. 
Again, all of these charts and diagrams are available in the supplemental lecture notes, and most of them are also available in high resolution for free from www.thetorchbearerseries.com. BRAID was originally derived from the computer term RAID, which stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. RAID is widely used in servers and internet cloud computer network clusters to ensure that no data can ever be lost. When RAID is implemented correctly, even if software or hardware damage occurs, the data remains perfectly intact and protected. If this were not the case, the world's banking system could not function, nor could the internet. Redundancy and protection of computer data are of the utmost importance as it is with the text of God's true written word. Just as RAID has protected computer data, BRAID has protected the accuracy and integrity of God's word. In computer terms, the simplest form of RAID is called a mirror, which requires two disks, or in our case with BRAID, two documents. Let's assume that manuscript number one and manuscript number two are both autographs, originals, shown here labeled as document number one and number two, but somehow they both obtained a small amount of damage to the Matthew 26 text after many years of being used to create copies from them. Please note, for our current purposes we are going to be using the terms document and manuscript interchangeably. As a result of a two-document B-RAID, we can use both documents to fill in the missing or damaged areas and thus produce a third 100% accurate manuscript. This third 100% accurate manuscript can now be copied from, knowing that this manuscript is just as accurate as the original autographs. On top of this, we already know that dozens, even potentially hundreds, of accurate manuscripts were created from the autographs. If you have a three-document B-RAID, you gain an additional capability. On top of being able to repair damage, you can also start to prevent copying mistakes during the circumstances in which they appear, and also prevent intentional corruption of the text. If two of the documents agree against a third document, the third document can be corrected, or a fourth document can be created to match the two documents that are correct. Similar to a computer RAID system with disk drives or solid state drives, the strength of BRAID is in the number of manuscripts you have. The more documents you have to start with early on, the greater the ability to reconstruct damaged areas accurately, even if widespread damage occurs and prevent corruption of the text. To show a real world example, we will be using two separate manuscripts which both contain Matthew chapter 26 verses 29 through 35, which is the same Bible verse as we have been using the whole time. Both manuscript images are from the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts and were dated to the 3rd century. While these manuscripts demonstrate how damaged manuscripts can appear and how B-RAID can apply to them, Manuscripts in this condition would not have been primarily utilized to copy from or to preserve the Word of God. There is an unbroken manuscript chain of custody of manuscripts that we believe were utilized instead, in conjunction with B-RAID. We will cover this unbroken chain of custody in Session 2 of this three-part lecture series. On the left we have P37, which is more intact as compared to P53 on the right. Since the verses in P53 overlap P37, we can potentially use P37 to reconstruct P53, or use P53 to clarify the faded text within P37. However good B-RAID is, the B-RAID system cannot function if its purpose is ignored or done away with in favor of faulty translations or agendas. If a single person or organization convinces everyone to abandon B-RAID and the unbroken manuscript chain of custody systems, which is an occurrence which we will later show happened in 1881, then erroneous additions, subtractions, and changes to the biblical text can occur. This includes the removal of dozens of Bible verses, 
such as the heretical removal of mark chapter sixteen verses nine through twenty and john chapter seven verse fifty three through chapter eight verse eleven from many new bibles for evidence of mark sixteen's legitimacy see the book called authentic the case for mark sixteen nine through twenty by james snap jr on the right side of the mark sixteen eight through twenty chart we are showing the traditional greek text used on the left side of the chart we see the same text in english with the twelve highlighted verses representing the removal of mark sixteen verses nine through twenty from many of the new bibles B-Raid has served its purpose through wars, famines, cultural changes, and intense persecution, and has protected against damage, corruption, and heretical alterations for over 1,800 years. When we previously mentioned B-Raid's ability to preserve manuscripts through cultural changes, which often trigger severe persecution, we were specifically thinking of the Teitler cycle. The Teitler cycle, also known as the Fatal Sequence, is often attributed to Scottish history professor Alexander Fraser Teitler in 1787, although there is debate on whether he was the originator. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been around 200 years. During those 200 years, these nations always progressed through the following sequence, as shown in the chart. One from bondage to spiritual faith two from spiritual faith to great courage three from courage to liberty four from liberty to abundance five from abundance to selfishness six from selfishness to complacency seven from complacency to apathy eight from apathy to dependence nine from dependence back into bondage there is an unbroken chain of custody for the resultant b raid that is protected by the torchbearers. Chain of custody refers to the chronological documentation or paper trail that records the sequence of custody, control, ownership, transfer, analysis, and disposition of physical or electronic evidence. Unbroken manuscript chain of custody, also known as umcoke, is a very important topic and we will discuss it some here. However, because of its complexity, we will tackle this more in depth in our next session. For the sake of time, we will skip going over all the details of the Disparagers and Satan versus Torchbearers and God chart and instead we will summarize it. The first row of the chart essentially summarizes the chart, so starting from left to right it reads, The disparagers believe we can only achieve 99.5% accuracy of reconstructing the Bible from the scraps and partial old manuscripts that we have today. They are not sure if we ever had 100% accurate text in one codex or scroll. The torchbearers believe we have 100% accuracy because God enabled the torchbearers to have and pass on the true and preserved 100% accurate text from one generation to the next through an unbroken chain of custody. If you like, you can read the entire chart contained in the supplemental lecture notes or by downloading the individual PDF or JPEG version of the chart from the website. We are going to go over some Bible verses that discuss God preserving His Word, and then we will conclude this section with evidence that divinely inspired translations are possible. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. He hath remembered His covenant forever the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage, forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. I know that whatsoever God doeth, 
it shall be for ever nothing can be put to it nor can anything taken from it and god doeth it that men should fear before him but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god something should be said about number eight some people have suggested that since god has said things on earth and in heaven that have not been recorded in the bible that this verse poses an impossible task to follow but anyone can understand what is meant by the verse it is referring to the things that we do know not the things that we don't continuing think not that i am come to destroy the law or the prophets i am not come to destroy but to fulfill for verily i say unto you till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail if he called them gods unto whom the word of god came and the scripture cannot be broken being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth for ever for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away but the word of the lord endureth for ever and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you additional bible verses on the subject are listed in the supplemental lecture notes can god preserve his word in english in the form of an english translation certainly god can do anything therefore the question is not whether he can rather we should ask would he he has preserved his old testament word in hebrew by jewish torchbearers and his new testament word in greek by predominantly gentile torchbearers why then would god stop there paleo hebrew was a sophisticated language at the time it was used and the hebrew people during the time of abraham isaac and jacob were one of the most powerful people groups in the world the roman empire with its advanced system of roads and speaking predominantly koine greek or common greek at the time of christ provided the means to reach the most amount of people by providing the new testament in koine greek is it reasonable that god selected great britain and the united states of america which are often considered amongst the most powerful and influential countries in the world and chose english the most geographically diverse spoken language of the last few hundred years to pass the torch to perhaps but is there evidence within the bible itself that shows that an inspired translation can take place most say that only the autographs were inspired but this is a modern concept which was first proposed by priest richard simon in sixteen eighty nine to prove we need textual criticism this view was popularized in eighteen eighty one by b b warfield and a a hodge and then by others many details for the stance of richard simon can be found in his sixteen eighty two book a critical history of the old testament but we'll move on first we must be clear about what inspiration means we define inspiration as dictionary dot com defines it quote, a divine influence directly and immediately exerted upon the mind or soul the divine quality of the writings or words of a person so influenced there is only one location in the bible that says the word inspiration and it is not referring to the autographs second timothy chapter three verses fifteen through sixteen reads quote, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in christ jesus all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness end quote so in these two verses paul is speaking to timothy telling him that he had the holy inspired scriptures 
which is an intriguing statement given that timothy didn't have the original thirteen hundred year old stone tablets or scrolls from moses as a child they were copies so therefore copies can be inspired scripture but what about translations there are translations within the bible itself the first of seven such examples we will go through is when joseph spoke in egyptian to his brothers which needed to be translated during the event but later also translated into hebrew in order to be documented within the bible and joseph said unto them the third day this do and live for i fear god if ye be true men let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison go ye carry corn for the famine of your houses but bring your youngest brother unto me so shall your words be verified and ye shall not die and they did so and they said one to another we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear therefore is this distress come upon us and reuben answered them saying spake i not unto you saying do not sin against the child and ye would not hear therefore behold also his blood is required and they knew not that joseph understood them for he spake unto them by an interpreter genesis chapter forty two verses eighteen through twenty three the following is a translation from a copy of a syrian letter into hebrew and in the days of artaxerxes wrote bishlam mishradath tabiel and the rest of their companions unto artaxerxes king of persia and the writing of the letter was written in the syrian tongue and interpreted in the syrian tongue ezra chapter four verse seven this is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him even unto artaxerxes the king thy servants the men on this side of the river and at such a time be it known unto the king that the jews which came up from thee to us are come unto jerusalem building the rebellious and the bad city and have set up the walls thereof and join the foundations ezra chapter four verses eleven through twelve the following is a translation from old testament hebrew in the new testament greek by jesus the lord said unto my lord sit thou at my right hand until i make thine enemies thy footstool psalm chapter one hundred and ten verse one and now the inspired translation taken from the new testament of luke chapter twenty verses forty two through forty three and david himself saith in the book of psalms the lord said unto my lord sit thou on my right hand till i make thine enemies thy footstool the following text is being interpreted from aramaic into greek and he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her talitha kumai which is being interpreted damsel i say unto thee arise mark chapter five verse forty one the following was spoken by paul in hebrew and yet the new testament is written in greek and when they heard that he spake in the hebrew tongue to them they kept the more silence and he saith i am verily a man which am a jew born in tarsus a city in cilicia yet brought up in this city at the feet of gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward god as ye all are this day acts chapter twenty two verses two through three here is another translation where paul is reciting to agrippa what jesus said to him in hebrew and this is recorded in the new testament in greek and when we were all fallen to the earth i heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the hebrew tongue saul saul why persecutest thou me it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks acts chapter twenty six verse fourteen the following is a translation from hebrew in the old testament that jesus is quoting but he is speaking in aramaic which is transliterated and recorded in aramaic the transliteration is why there's two spellings for aloy aloy and aloy aloy 
It is spelled how it sounds, and since Hebrew and Aramaic have sounds that can't be directly represented in the letters of the Greek, you have two spelling differences. Then it's translated and recorded in Greek. This is done not once, but twice, once by Matthew and again by Mark. This first verse is the quoted verse in the Old Testament coming from Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? The following is an inspired translation from Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The following is an inspired translation from Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So we went from Egyptian into Hebrew into English, Syrian into Hebrew into English, Hebrew into Greek into English, Aramaic into Greek into English, Hebrew into Greek into English, Hebrew into Greek into English again, Hebrew into Aramaic into Greek twice into English twice. People working on their own could not produce perfect inspired text copies, or within even the autographs, but only God-fearing men of faith working under the divine guidance of God's Holy Ghost can produce perfect text and translations. As we have provided, there are inspired translations contained within the original languages of the Bible itself. Is it then reasonable that a translation into English could be inspired and guided by God? If you have a Bible and don't believe it is inspired, then you do not have scripture. Second Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 through 16 states, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In the next session, we will follow the unbroken manuscript chain of custody of Bible lineage from the apostles to today. You will see that the unbroken chain does not lead to all Bible versions. The Bible is a tightly integrated design with each book directly or indirectly referencing each other as shown in the chart on the left creating its own internal redundancy. Each book verifies each other's content and authorship as shown in the chart. The blue and the red lines represent over 2,800 instances of cross-referencing within the books of the Bible. The blue lines are references from the Old Testament, while the red lines are references from the New Testament. There are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament some of which only could be fulfilled by hostile enemies who would not have a stake in fulfilling the prophecies. For example, Marcus Pontius Pilate, who was a Roman prefect, also known as the governor of Judea, from 26 to 36 AD, serving directly under the emperor Tiberius of Rome, presided at the trial of Jesus and gave the order for his crucifixion. Governor Pilate wrote on a sign in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin that was placed on Jesus' cross, which read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This fulfilled one of the prophecies, much to the protest of the Jewish rabbis at the time, that Jesus would be called a king. See Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 in the Old Testament. Also keep in mind that just because something was fulfilled in the past does not mean it will not have a second related fulfillment in the future. The Jewish model for prophecy is a cyclical pattern, repeating patterns until ultimate final fulfillment. The Greek model of prophecy, which is the prophecy formula most think of when they hear the word prophecy, is a non-repeating prediction fulfillment model, a one and done, which differs greatly from the Jewish model. You may have heard a comparison of the biblical manuscripts to the telephone game, where a group of people sit in a circle and whisper a sentence from one to another. 
Then once it reaches the first person again, it is nothing like it was when it was first spoken. However, when speaking of biblical manuscripts, there is no way for the telephone game problem to occur for the following reasons. 1. Not one, but multiple eyewitness sources wrote down what was spoken. This includes unintentional, collaborated accounts from enemies of Christianity, which attest to the truthfulness of many events. 2. Some first-person eyewitness accounts were written down immediately by a trained biblical stenographer, also known as a shorthand or quick writer. 3. There were dozens to hundreds of first-generation copies. 4. Copying methods used were second to none in both the early Hebrew and Greek texts, even counting every letter, which was copied by extremely loyal and dedicated torchbearers who were willing to endure torture and even be killed to protect the true text. 5. Sent autographs and retained autographs, which enabled later copies to be checked and verified against the originals for hundreds of years, at least up until the year 313 AD, at which point the B-Raid system had been firmly established and would be incredibly effective. 6. The B-Raid system would prevent errors or intentional tampering attempts against the legitimate manuscripts. And 7. As we will demonstrate in the next session, there's an unbroken manuscript chain of custody for the resultant B-Raid manuscripts, which was protected even to the death by the torchbearers. We will also show from history the multiple attempts to circumvent the B-Raid system entirely, along with the resultant B-Raid text. And lastly, the most important factor in all of this, and that is that God said he would preserve his pure word until heaven and earth pass away. It's up to you to decide if what you learned is both reasonable and probable. Please join us in our next session, which will be much more exciting and contain many surprises, as we will present the Chart of New Testament Lineage Streams Unbroken Chain of Custody, which will provide you with the necessary information and evidence to have the strongest faith possible, because not all Bibles are based upon the same Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text. Until next time, may God always provide you with an open heart, mind, and spirit to follow him in his ways, above our own ways and above the ways of man. All credit, praise, honor, and glory belongs to our beloved God.